very much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Aviral Kumar, uh, and today with Aniket Singh, I'll talk about uh, a workflow for offline model-free robotic reinforcement learning. And this is joint work with Stephen Tian, Chelsea Finn, and Sergey Levin. So standard online reinforcement learning algorithms typically train via trial and error. That is the agent unrolls its partly trained policy in the environment, uses it to collect more data, uses the collected data for improving its policy, and then repeats this process all over again. In contrast, offline reinforcement learning algorithms aim to learn from a previously collected data set of past interaction. And this, and this data set can come from prior RL runs, human demonstrations, scripted interaction, et cetera. And the agent is not allowed to access uh, the environment as in it, it's not allowed to do any online rollouts over the course of training uh, when it learns a policy. So such a scheme is quite attractive for a variety of reasons. For example, it uh, allows us to potentially use large uh, general purpose experience, uh, the large general purpose data sets of experience to train uh, policies that can effectively solve multiple tasks. And it also removes the need for any unsafe or expensive active data collection in the real world over the course of training, which is especially a, a, a quite a important consideration in the robotics domain. So uh, in this work, what uh, we want to tackle is what would it actually take to apply these offline RL algorithms effectively into robotics? And, and there are many recent algorithms that have been proposed, but uh, how, what would it take to take them from this, uh, from this algorithm design for, uh, uh, standpoint to, into like the real world? And to answer this question, let's first uh, ask the same question in the context of supervised deep learning, which now has made, it way, made its way to the real world. And I would argue that there are two key factors here that make supervised deep learning perform well. The first is the choice of a good algorithm, which is in supervised learning, just running stochastic gradient descent on a cross entropy objective with a large network, which, which works quite, quite uh, pretty well. And the second is what I would call a workflow, uh, uh, which basically is a set of guidelines on being able to make design decisions to tune various uh, aspects such as network capacity, regularization, and hyperparameter tuning. And such a workflow basically enables a practitioner to take this general purpose algorithm and adapt it to the best design decisions for their own tasks that they care about. For example, in supervised learning, you could have a held out validation data set. You could measure the, the, the loss on this validation data set, and you could, you could use this as a proxy for your test performance. And you could, uh, you could do all sorts of good things with it, like you can do early stopping, increase your capacity, add regularization, et cetera. And this works uh, pretty good in, in, in practice. So we already have good offline RL algorithms out there, at least uh, uh, from a benchmarks uh, perspective. So how can we tune them or how can we design a workflow for them? How can a practitioner take them and adapt them to, to uh, adapt it to their problem? And uh, so it turns out that one of the bigger limitations here for offline RL is that most of the procedures for tuning offline RL methods currently actually need to do online rollouts in the real world to, 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 to select policies, to select hyperparameters. And this essentially just defeats the purpose of offline RL in the first place because uh, you are essentially, in a, in a sense, running uh, partly trained policies which could do all sorts of crazy things like crash your autonomous vehicle into a, uh, into a tree uh, in the real world, um, even though it's just for evaluation. But you don't want to do that because it's, it can be a matter of life and death, basically. And so in some sense, the, the, the key question here is we want to be able to tune these offline RL methods also in a pure offline manner. The, the conventional wisdom here, uh, which has been studied for a long time now, is we want to we, we can do this via off-policy evaluation or OPE methods, which basically uh, take in a policy that, that is given to it, and they would try to estimate how good the policy is by estimating its value function, return, etc. Now, these methods are good because they, they, they don't care about where uh, uh, the policy comes from, but the biggest limitation, which is really the, the big practical challenge with these methods, is that they have hyperparameters of their own, which are pretty similar to conventional offline RL algorithms, and recent works have shown that tuning these hyperparameters of, of policy evaluation methods is already an open problem that cannot be solved in an offline manner. So in some sense, you, you haven't solved the problem, you just delegated it to like a different step. So what we do in this paper is we consider a different view on, on tuning offline RL methods from the perspective of designing a workflow, which is basically, what does that mean? It means given an offline RL algorithm, can I find a way to tune its hyperparameters? The good point here is that there's no additional hyperparameters that are introduced. It's just the, the algorithm that you began with. Uh, and, and, and also another good point here is if you think about this uh, from the perspective of choosing between various policies that you can, you can train, now in this, in, in this case, you only are concerned about uh, choosing between policies that your algorithm produces. So that your offline RL algorithm that you are well aware about because you are trying to tune this on your task, only that algorithm produces those policies which you are sort of tuning from. And which is a much easier problem than this general purpose like policy evaluation uh, type, uh, type formulation. So the, the key question that we want to answer here is, here is, can we devise a set of sort of offline metrics, pretty much like sort of validation error that, that, that practitioners can track 
and then a set of guidelines that can allow practitioners to 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 interpret the values of these metrics and accordingly adjust various knobs of their offline al uh, algorithm uh, and and this hopefully allows us to get like much better policy performance okay so before diving down into our workflow let me very quickly go into what offline rl is about what kind of challenges are faced and what algorithms uh, have been proposed so if you take a standard rl algorithm such as q learning where the q value is sort of an estimate of how good an agent is doing uh, on top, uh, in, in terms of its long-term return. So this is the agent's estimate of how well it is doing. Turns out that in offline RL, often at times you have a limited data set. So the actions that you use to compute target values for training your Q function might, might actually be unseen and might actually be out of distribution of the, of the, of the, of the actions in your training data set. When you, when you use these uh, out of distribution actions with this max operator, that will inevitably end up compounding some sort of overestimation bias into your Q function because you are backing up from unseen values. And what this will, what effect this will happen, uh, this will have is that it will uh, cause your learned policy to deviate away from your data set. So if your data set are these black trajectories, it will cause you to go to unseen regions, which the agent is thinking are quite good because they have really high Q values, but they actually may not be good in terms of the reward because uh, I mean, those regions might just be like unsafe. It could be a car crashing uh, on, on your road. And so several algorithms have been proposed here uh, to, to tackle this issue, which, uh, which are uh, of wide variety, like algorithms that would penalize Q values to not be really high on these unseen behaviors, algorithms that would constrain the learned policy to be close to the data and so on. And I would not go into these details uh, here, but we will consider a class of these algorithms and, and try to tune them. So, in, so in, in this work, what we do is we try to consider offline RL algorithms that penalize Q functions and we try to design a workflow for these algorithms. So the primary algorithm that I would want to briefly introduce here is this algorithm called conservative Q learning, which basically uh, trains a Q function using a standard RL objective, which is Bellman error, temporal difference error, using the recursion that I showed on the previous slide. And it pushes down these Q values on unseen action. So it just tries to make sure that you don't go to unseen regions by pushing down the Q value. Uh, our, our workflow also applies to other methods like BRAC, which, uh, which are methods that do similar things, but in a different fashion. And I'll not go into details here in the interest of time, but these are in the paper. Okay, so now let's come to the, new, uh, to the interesting uh, material, which is what, how does our workflow actually work? So let me first present the schematic skeleton of our workflow, uh, and I'll try to bring in connections to supervised learning. And then I'll go into the components of this workflow in the subsequent slide. So our workflow first characterizes the run of an offline RL algorithm as overfitting or underfitting. Now in this case, overfitting is said to happen when the performance of the policy first increases and then decreases over the course of training when you do more gradient updates. Underfitting is said to happen when the performance of the policy is just low and does not improve much at all and just saturates at a, at a, at a not so great value. Now to address underfitting, uh, we could kind of sort of at a, at a very high level, take some inspiration from supervised learning and do some kind of capacity increase of the algorithm. And this does not just mean increasing your network size because capacity of an RL algorithm can be quite complex. And I'll go into what this sort of means briefly. And for addressing overfitting, we could do some sort of uh, capacity reduction and early stopping to, to find the policy with the, with the best performance. Now, this might appear very similar to supervised learning in the sense that this is exactly what I do in supervised learning. But turns out there are many major differences in terms of how you would, uh, how you would actually uh, implement such a workflow in practice. And the reason is because here, uh, I mean, I could define these things in terms of policy return, but uh, I don't have access to the policy return in, in an offline manner because I, I cannot unroll my policy. And so uh, just uh, using, so, so, so just a supervised learning workflow where you could use a validation error is not going to work here because here you care about policy return, not your training objectives, like not your training temporal difference error. And so it's a big problem as to what, as to how even you kind of uh, measure these uh, overfitting or underfitting effects in practice without access to online work. And that's what we solve in our paper. So let's first consider uh, the case of overfitting. So as I mentioned, overfitting refers to the case when the performance goes up and starts coming back down as you train more. Turns out that fortunately for the case of conservative offline RL methods, we can detect overfitting by just keeping the, uh, by just looking at the trend in the learned Q values uh, of the algorithm. And this, is, this can be done in a completely offline fashion. So if the Q values uh, first go up and then start coming back down, this means that overfitting is happening. And we, we have a theoretical uh, argument in the paper to show that this indeed means overfitting is happening on the policy return as well. And now uh, what we can do is we could, we could do early stopping at the point of the maximum Q value. We could add regularization to, to fix overfitting, to stabilize Q values uh, and so on. In fact, on, on this task that I show on the slide, um, if you, uh, and this is the plot of the Q values. So the blue line is the base offline RL algorithm, which is CQL in this case. So Q values go up and come back down. Whereas uh, for uh, the case of when you add regularization, you can stabilize the Q values as shown in this orange line. 
and uh, uh, as I just mentioned briefly, uh, the, 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 the policy you would want to deploy or select or early stop at would be the peak in the Q values here. Turns out that if you just measure the returns of all these policies, um, so just for analysis purposes, just to see whether our workflow is working, you'll find that these policies are actually good. So these are not the best policies, but they're pretty good. They're, they're close to the, to, to, to the best policy. And adding regularization does actually improve the policy performance by two x. So in some sense, you can now freely deploy these policies without caring too much about, without uh, being worried about whether they'll work well or not. Next, let's try to understand the case of underfitting. So in, in the case of underfitting, the performance is just worse and does not increase too much with more training. And to measure underfitting, turns out that, again, a very simple uh, thing ends up working. Uh, and we show this in the paper as well, why uh, it works, which is basically you could track the, the values of the training losses, such as the training temporal difference loss over the course of training. If this loss is, uh, is kind of high and does not decrease too much, and the Q values are not reducing, so there's no overfitting happening and the losses are high, then we could kind of say that underfitting is happening. And we show this uh, theoretically as well. To fix underfitting, we can either use big policy networks or increase the capacity of the Q function in some way, but that's not quite easy. And I would love to discuss with you more about uh, more on the poster about how you could increase Q function capacity. So as shown in this example, um, essentially uh, the, the dash line, so these are two tasks in, in the real world and, and Aniket will cover the results uh, more in detail. But uh, these two tasks, um, uh, the, the, the dash lines are the, uh, the Q values learned by CQL, they're increasing. So no overfitting is happening. This is the Q value plot. But the losses for these dashed lines are pretty high. So they are quite, they're going up even. Um, and turns out that if you use a bigger network here, uh, it's just enough to prevent this Q values from, uh, from going up. And it reduces the, the temporal difference error as well. And as we show, it also improves performance drastically. There's also many other details here, like tuning other hyperparameters, like the conservatism hyperparameter, et cetera. And, and a, lot of, a lot of these things are in the paper. And I, I, we would love to discuss with you uh, on the poster as well. But I, I'll skip here in the interest of time. Okay, now Aniket will talk about evaluating our workflow on real robots. Thank you. Um, empirically, we evaluate our approach on real robot manipulation tasks on two different robot platforms, the Sawyer and the Widow X. We utilize offline data sets collected by prior papers. There are three tasks of interest, placing a lid on a pot, opening a drawer, and a pick and place task. Let's first consider the Sawyer tasks and consider how to use our proposed workflow in these domains without access to any online tuning. In this domain, we saw underfitting occurring and thus used models with higher capacity as recommended by the workflow. We then evaluated the policies with and without the underfitting correction. From the baseline CQL algorithm to the workflow specified underfitting correction, um, we see an improvement in performance from zero out of 12 to eight out of 12 and nine out of 12 in the two Sawyer manipulation tasks. Below, you can see the robot placing a lid on a pot and opening a drawer. We also use our workflow for a pick and place task on the WidowX robot. When we run CQL on this domain, we find that the Q values exhibit an increasing and then decreasing trend, as shown in the blue line in the plot. This is indicative of overfitting. Our workflow would then suggest to deploy the policy near the peak in the Q value in the real world, and this is indicated by the vertical green line. We then evaluated these checkpoints to show the effectiveness of utilizing this fix from our workflow and see an improvement from the baseline CQL algorithm of three out of nine to seven out of nine with policy selection. Notice that the data set collection policy only succeeds 35% of the time, so CQL does improve on it with the policy selection criterion. To address overfitting, we use the regularization of the Q function network as recommended by our workflow. As seen in the plot on the right, the regularizer gives rise to more flat Q values, which you can see in the brown line in the figure. This indicates that this regularizer is effective in preventing overfitting. The performance of the policy as a result is also reasonably flat between seven out of nine and eight out of nine, which allows a practitioner to choose any reasonable checkpoint during training. In summary, applying offline RL to real world problems will require designing online offline workflows, which requires making the behavior of offline RL methods interpretable. 
We present a first step towards de devising an offline workflow without any online interaction for certain offline RL algorithms, which empirically seem to work well even on real robots. Some questions in this area pertain to devising theoretical guarantees for workflows of this type and utilizing validation sets. Finally, I would like to invite you to our poster and please check out our paper. Thank you. Thanks, Booth. Great presentation. Thank you. So um, we are running a bit out of time. So um, they are suggesting me to just keep questions for this paper. Uh, but I suggest still to follow up in the chat to get maybe questions and try to, to answer them. Um, yeah, I'm, get, I'm getting like, you know, live inputs here. Maybe there is a quick question from the audience. Let's, let's try to get that. Otherwise, we'll move on. Alexandra, can you help us on that? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, cool. So uh, thanks for the great presentation. Um, I was wondering about the overfitting detection. So you mentioned that, you know, the Q values go up and then down, but in the offline learning case, I could also imagine a case where the Q network just has incorrect beliefs about the environment and goes up and stays up and there's, you know, no more experience to kind of correct those delusions. Do you have intuition for why we don't see that pattern? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So uh, that's a thing that actually I did not talk about too much in the paper. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, the, so if you can tune the conservatism hyperparameter in the offline setting. So remember that these algorithms are offline RL algorithms that are actually pessimistic towards unseen outcomes. So they, they are conservative. They, they prevent you from going there. So if you, so what we do actually, the, the complete procedure is to first tune the conservatism hyperparameter that will allow us to be pessimistic uh, on these unseen outcomes. And so once you do that, you would not see your Q values blowing up uh, and, and going up too much. So. Once you do that, and then if you fix overfitting and unfitting, you'll find that your Q values go, will go down and will not go up uh, indefinitely because of the kind of algorithm and the knob that you're doing. So I'd be happy to discuss more on this, like, in fact, even the math on this uh, on the poster, uh, if you're interested. Perfect. All right. Thanks again to Aviral and Aniket. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on at this point. I'll pass it back to Lateral for uh, next